Um, can I just see a sort of show of hands? How many people here are planners? A good few planners here. Uh, how many people are architects? Students? Um, and how about um, people from sort of local authority? So have I, have I missed anyone out? Sorry? Landscape architects, of course, yes. <laughs> and we've, got, we've got a really good spread anyway, so uh, um, I'm going to um, really be talking about it from the architectural perspective, but of course as we've seen from some of the eminent speakers before and some of the wonderful examples we've seen, uh, it does cross uh, many different disciplines. And so hopefully we can sort of see the opportunity that actually arises from thinking about water right from the outset of design. Uh, this is quite a good slide because it sort of illustrates uh, obviously all of the uh, projects that I'm working on, which is, is something I'm very proud of, um, but equally it is various different projects which are working with water. So for example, uh, this is the, uh, oh, the pointer disappears here, so I, I'll use my hand. This is the, uh, the life, some examples from the LIFE project. Uh, this is a, a river bus that we got planning consent for in Norwich. Uh, this is a, a lagoon that we're developing down in Littlehampton as part of a flood uh, strategy to, to reduce flood risk for the existing city. Uh, this is an amphibious house that we're working on, uh, a scheme in Dordrecht, so lo lots of different things. And each one of them is all, you know, really sort of taking water right at the heart to try and make something special out of, out of our placemaking. And for too long we've sort of forgotten about water, but actually when you think about uh, many different civilizations, we've all grown up around water. Well, quite frankly, we wouldn't really have any towns and cities if we didn't have water at the heart of them, because it's transport, it's sustenance, and it's a lot of the great things that we think about in terms of Rome, Venice, uh, Angkor Wat, uh, the whole Mayan civilizations, many different examples. So, uh, just looking at some of the uh, recent events. Now, it was interesting hearing one of the speakers mention about the fact that we easily forget things from the past. This is, uh, I'm going to talk about flooding a bit, it's very topical, uh, and, but actually it's still a driver for change. This is uh, Hurricane Katrina in, in New Orleans and how devastating and extensive that was. Uh, this is the uh, tsunami in Japan, uh, which I was at a talk last week to see how they're sort of trying to engage communities to redevelop some of their... Uh, some of the society there. This is another example. We forget how water may well be the initial threat, but obviously it can cause other effects. This is in, in Germany, this is in the UK, and the unpleasant things that come with water. Uh, and this is uh, down on the Somerset levels. So a lot of people have been talking at the moment about learning from the Dutch. Uh, we do a bit of work in Holland, so we're always keen to learn from the Dutch, and we, we've learned some really good lessons from the Dutch about their wonderful flood defences. So this is a uh, an example of the potential fallibi, fall fallibility of, uh, of flood defences. There are many good things we can learn from, from the Dutch, of course, uh, in terms of some of the sort of floating homes and innovations and stuff. But what that, that last slide illustrates is the potential risk when we focus on one solution over another. And I know the talk is about water sensitive, sensitive urban design, but I do feel it's appropriate to, to really sort of think about the impact of not actually planning for water in our towns and cities. And we, whilst we have, uh, are faced with climate change, of course, what we don't know is what the future climate change will actually be. And we have many predictions, but that doesn't necessarily mean we can be certain about those. And we can invest a lot of money into uh, extending our defences, but there's always a risk that if we get that expectation wrong, that we might get a really big storm that overwhelms those flood defences. Or we might put you know, too much money into it, we're still not prepared, you know, should uh, events catch us uh, uh, unaware. So what I'm really interested in is actually using architecture to build space for water, to actually uh, make our placemaking better, but equally to actually try and reduce the impacts on other uh, existing towns and developments around it. So actually, people talk about, well, don't build on floodplains. But I'd say, well, actually, if we're going to regenerate some of these areas that are in floodplains, we should do it in a way that actually makes it better for other people, and we can. Uh, we developed a project which Sue mentioned uh, in the introduction called the LIFE project. Uh, really the main point about this is long term. It's about thinking longer term than, than, uh, than the immediate benefits that we might have from society uh, and development now and actually thinking about well, when we do carry out development 
we should be managing the risk of flooding, but also we shouldn't just be thinking about water because we've now that's, we've shifted our emphasis from sustainability and green roofs over to water. Fantastic, but we shouldn't forget about the sustainability and we should make sure we deliver those things like the zero carbon uh, development so that we actually reduce the impacts and reduce the effects of climate change as is happening in Cambridge wonderfully. Uh, and so going back to the defences, I mean the approach we like to take is, is we'll say well let's, let's work with the water, let's live with the water, let's see how it, it will actually flow naturally and try and integrate that within our, in our planning. So this is a, a, an example of a conveniently located site where we have houses up on a higher area and we have some land that we can work with. But what we're trying to demonstrate is you could create space for water by actually putting these green areas alongside the river courses. Maybe we kind of illustrate that so that in some times of flood that they actually do flood and we see that and we see that what their purpose is for. But in a very big event like we've seen recently in the Thames and Somerset and other parts of the, the country, that we actually know where the water's going to go and we try to um, design our town so that the water will flow in those areas in the landscape and so on and in car parks and things rather than into our homes and all of this can be done by just thinking ahead and of course what's amazing about this is that it becomes a space driver it actually transforms the way in which we plan our towns and cities and it was encouraging to see that the work in, in, in Cambridge in particular but some of the other examples where the water actually goes right through the heart of development so not just on the side but actually integrates through the spatial plan and we start to see things like the energy hub in the centre uh, and then we have areas where if we're further uh, upstream as it were or up in the higher catchment we actually use green roofs and, and things to store and slow the rain flow um, but when we get lower down towards the water level we can still design our properties to be resilient and these could be things like uh, uh, play areas and things, or parkland, or car parks, as I said. And this is a fantastic example where you can see the sort of fish mounted on the poles, so that as a visual cue, you know, you can imagine a child saying, well, why are there fish on the poles? Well, it's, it's, it's because it's there to store water. You just hope that maybe the water doesn't ever get to the height of the fish so that they swim away. Um, and in terms of uh, designing our sustainable buildings, you know, we should think about how water can actually drive environmental benefits. So this is uh, using a labyrinth system to actually uh, provide sort of pre-cooling of air coming into buildings. So this is a, a space which can be designed to actually flood and store flood water, but for the rest of the time, you know, the 50 odd years where it doesn't flood, is actually providing a net benefit by providing cooling. Well, we've done some following research on that through the CAM project. And of course, you know, we're all influenced by policy, but we've got to think big and as well. So there's lots of do documents and guidance, but the principle is actually not about whether it's suds or water sensitive urban design, or not even whether it's life, but actually it's about just making sure that water's at the heart of our design, and it's, and it's about good design. So I'm just going to talk through a, different, a few different projects, and, and scale is a good illustration. So we can, we can see how we can think big, but we can also do stuff at a small scale to make a, 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 an influence. And I always think it's a bit like ASDA, where it's sort of every little helps. And there is an opportunity to do that, and I'll show you, show you right at the end if I get time, uh, my own project that I'm just finishing at the moment where I've got a big flood storage area, green roofs and green walls and things like that. Um, and this is, this is something which even uh, all around the world people get. So at the large scale, over in, in Holland at the moment, they've been developing a, a, a national programme called Room for the River. It's very much like making space for water in the UK. Simple idea, it's actually, well, the, the river needs space to expand in terms of, of flood. So this is uh, in Nijmegen. This is a, a village of Lent, Lent that they're redeveloping. And this is the existing dike line. Relocating the dike line so that we can create a flood relief channel uh, along the land here that will, and a series of bridges uh, that will actually divert water from the main river. This is like the motorway. It's like the M25 of uh, river courses in, in Holland. It goes up towards the, uh, Germany to become the Rhine and down to the uh, North Sea. Uh, and, but, but what was really fascinating about it is the driver is a big scale project to try and reduce flood risk but actually it creates this wonderful kind of peninsula of land and we had to sort of try and work out what we could do with it with 8 metres water level variation uh, annually. And so we said well it should be a, a showcase for wonderful new architecture and landscape design uh, to actually try and deal with this sort of water space and we said well even if we're going to do a big tower building or something like this, this should actually have water at the heart of it, it should uh, absorb the water and uh, reuse the water that, that lands on the building, maybe we can have different states of water where we can have uh, an area that's elevated storing the water which we can freeze and turn into an ice rink at times or you can climb on the building, let's, let's have some fun with this as well. 
Um, but it's about this very serious problem about the amount of water that flows through here, using the sort of understanding energy, uh, sorry, the, the, the flows that run through, so we can actually divert some of that and, uh, and reduce the rest to the existing town. And, and as I said, this, this creates this kind of wonderful environment that changes with this, this eight meters of, of water level variation, leaving this little island in the middle of it. And so we wanted to try and create a, a place where people could learn about water, get down and touch the water. And these are sort of resilient buildings and amphibious buildings and so on, which could showcase different technologies. And this is now on site at the moment. So this is with the Dutch thinking big. And you can see they're making very good progress. So then at the medium scale, this is the project in Norwich. And this is on the edge of, of Norwich. Again, very similar situation to Cambridge. Funnily enough, reclaimed, a lot of it's reclaimed land from the Dutch uh, engineers. We were all, all floodplains, so we've got a lot of uh, watercourses to deal with. And what we wanted to do is to work... Oops, work. So what we wanted to do is to create space for water within the new development. So actually, the, by uh, giving planning consent for a new development of almost 700 homes, we're actually reducing the flood risk to some of the surrounding areas by storing more water. We were actually... The, the solution was to take land away that there was there. So normally people say, we'll just build, raise the land up, build on higher land and stuff. We said, no, 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 we're not going to do that. What we're going to do is we're going to take land away to actually make more space for water and create space for uh, more ecology, for swales, extend that in between the buildings and work with these flood flows so that you can uh, see that the buildings will actually be uh, safe from this. And, and you see uh, in some areas it sort of goes across the buildings, but we're actually elevated above that so the water flows underneath and we use that for cooling. And you see at the heart of it, you know, the, the whole environment is about working with water, so people understand that their uh, landscape is actually designed to work with water. And of course the great thing about this is this becomes part of our, our natural sustainable drainage system, it also becomes an extension to the marsh, uh, and it becomes a sort of wonderful place where, imagine as a kid, you sort of, you get up and you muck around and you sort of play in this, in this sort of amazing kind of wetland park area. And maybe you just need a, a kind of one of those purple taps at the end to wash off your shoes before you come in again and drive mum mad. Um, and of course, sorry, I should go back to this. And of course, what the, the important point I was mentioning earlier is that with all these new homes that we're building, wonderful as they may be, unless they're all zero carbon, we're actually increasing our carbon emissions. So we're sort of still trying to make sure that we're responding to that and addressing the impacts that will happen as a result of all the uh, other impacts of climate change, in particular in Norwich, the shortage of water and the, and the overheating risk for it. And this is our future weather forecast. Drives the uh, University of East Anglia mad when we show these sort of diagrams. They prefer, you know, the technical kind of approach, but it's easy for us to understand. But generally, everything's getting worse. You know, sunnier, wetter, uh, you know, hotter, drier, you know, all the kind of uh, problems. But of course, it, it also means that we have a sort of uh, change in, in temperature and climate that might, might lead, you know, result in some sort of fun as well. But what was most interesting about the work that we were doing with the university was identifying that we had very little understanding of exactly what's going to happen in the future and what we needed to do is to develop much more adaptable solutions so what we did is we took our scheme in Norwich and we tested it by saying well you know if we need to provide additional rainwater harvesting in the future you know we're talking about 40,000 litres of rainwater harvesting where can we put that can we design our, our, our solution now so that it can be adapted in the future whether that be in 20 or 30 years uh, or should we be using grey, grey water uh, harvest, uh, so recycling instead? Because actually we can predict that. Uh, can we think about plants that actually we plant them now so that in the future they actually provide the shading when we need them? And if we're going to design resilient build, uh, materials, what should they be? Could this be a better solution than this? Because it's got thermal mass to it so we can actually provide cooling. And so when we started to bring all this stuff together, we found that by using some good design, by thinking ahead, we could actually design a building that was uh, adapted to the flood risk, it dealt with the future uh, uh, potential peak water levels, but equally it could be adapted to provide cooling again uh, as well in the future. And, uh, and it was through a whole series of measures that we identified if this is our kind of baseline now, that we can start to integrate new measures to the building to actually adapt to to the potential increasing temperature. So there's a wonderful synergy between working with water and adapting to uh, future overheating. 
and this is our timeline that we generated so we could say to our developers you don't necessarily have to spend all your money now doing this you just have to design it well so it means someone else can adapt this and provide these things in the future whether it be in uh, 2030 where we need to increase the amount of rainwater harvesting tanks or whether it be in, in sort of uh, uh, 2050 where we start to have to bring in extra shading devices and stuff but we design our buildings so that they can be adapted one minute so finally on to the small scale and this is the ASDA you know every little helps uh, this is a scheme that we're developing at the moment with the BRE which is about a, a flood resilient uh, building so see if we can get the video to work and this is showing that even if you've got existing buildings or if you've got uh, um, uh, you know, buildings that might become susceptible to flood risk in the future, bear in mind that uh, uh, t about six years ago we thought there was about two and a half million properties at risk of flooding. Now we think there's five million uh, homes at risk of flooding. So we do need to be aware that these things will change. And this is about the water. And this, is, this has got a landscape in front that kind of provides an early warning system. It's an intuitive landscape so you know when the floodwaters are coming. It also actually creates, cre creates space for water underneath the building. So it actually reduces the flood risk to some of the surrounding properties. And uh, unfortunately, it, uh, work stopped on site at the moment as uh, it's currently being completely flooded. But of course, which is a shame because if we built this a year earlier, we'd be able to demonstrate how well it works. Uh, and finally, uh, on my own project, this is a, an urban site well away from the water course. Um, so it's no, there's nothing evident really about the potential risk and the opportunity to reduce water. But I said, oh, well, I want to still put water at the, uh, at the centre of this. And so the uh, strategy was to really kind of try and slow the rain flow, to capture it, to harvest some of the water, and to reduce some of the pressures on the existing sewage systems by putting in green roofs and green walls. And you can see this is a 17 uh, cubic metre tank going into the central courtyard space. Uh, this is all designed to be able to drive over as well. Uh, all being sealed up, so this now stores water. And uh, this is, you can see, the sort of green strip starting to be put in to the construction at the moment. And what was fascinating about this is that uh, I said to some of my neighbours, I said, we, we, didn't, we didn't really have the same sort of uh, amount of rain flow that, uh, in the rest of the country this year. It's been a lot better than last year. And they said, what are you talking about? My garden is like a bog. I was, hold on, other places completely dry. And uh, suddenly it occurred to me, of course, it's because it's working so brilliantly well. <laughs> And this is a, a picture of my wife and I uh, sort of living the dream with water at the heart of our development. Thank you very much.